Hey there kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and before we get started on tonight's story, I want to take a quick second to let you know about chilling. I talk about chilling quite a bit, because, well, I'm a part of it, so... Yeah, I kind of talk about it. Chilling is an app that's currently available on Apple, iTunes, and Android, and, you know, basically anywhere you can get your app from. And it's got a whole bunch of horror stories that you're able to listen to, you know, kind of like the stories that you hear here, except it's not just me, even though I am on there. Uh, there's stories that are all exclusive just to the Chilling app, as well as stories from a whole bunch of other friends of mine, such as Autumn Ivy, and honestly, it's like a bunch of creepypasta narrators. Not to mention, it's also got this really cool system that allows you to use your own background music, choose your own music that is actually from Mew. So the music that you would hear around here, you could be able to set up the ones that you want to be able to hear, the music that you like, or the, the ambience that you like. And now, since it's their one year anniversary, they're doing a giveaway. I know they usually have a giveaway and I talk about it, but this one's really cool. The chilling one year anniversary giveaway is a Samsung 70 inch class seven series LED 4K UHD smart television. Not joking. <laughs> it is a 70 inch television that they're giving away. They're giving away a 4.1 channel sound bar. And of course you get a limited edition year one t-shirt from chilling. So the only things you need to do to enter are start your free trial of it. So it's free to enter. Head over to chillingapp.com and click on the giveaway. Fill out a little bit of a form, leave your review of the chilling app and boom, you could be, you could be having a new television and sound bar. I mean, I, mean, I might enter that. Are you kidding me? I need a new television. <laughs> but yes, as I was saying, chilling app. It's wonderful. It's great. Check it out. You like horror? You like chilling. And now, on to tonight's story. That's the last of it, I said, breathing a sigh and collapsing onto the couch. I am officially toast. I just finished hauling the last couple of boxes into the house from the moving truck. Stacks of them were piled throughout the living room, making a corrugated forest around me. Unpacking would be another long adventure, but at least we had finally gotten all our belongings into the farmhouse so that we could begin the process of starting our new life here. As I lay on the couch relaxing momentarily, the hairs began to stand up on the back of my neck. I started to get a strong sense that I was being watched, specifically from the door beneath the stairs leading to the basement. It creaked open slowly, just a crack, as I observed it back. I closed my eyes, ignoring that paranoid feeling. There was no one else in the house except for us. Therefore, nobody was watching me. It was just my imagination. Yet, still, every time I turned away, I felt a tingling, and I saw a vague shadow in that direction, just barely visible in my peripherals. It was also a feeling of a presence that I couldn't ignore. The door to the basement yawned open wider as if inviting me in. Darkness peered out, blacker than a midnight graveyard. Standing up on shaky legs, I began to walk over to that door, thinking a draft from the basement was blowing it open. I didn't like the feeling of it being ajar. Don't ask me why, but I just... I just didn't like it. As I drew closer, the sensation of eyes watching me became even more powerful, as if I was drawing closer to a predator, and my body was telling me to turn away and run. That darkness was too much for me to look at, so I turned my eyes away briefly, but that made the feeling even worse. I, I couldn't help thinking that if something jumped out of the doorway, I wouldn't see it until it was too late, so I looked back again forcing myself to focus my attention on the eerie blackness. When I returned my gaze to the doorway, I could have sworn I saw eyes looking at me from the darkness for a brief instant, so, so quick that it could have passed off as a trick of the light. But it made my heart skip a beat nonetheless. I slammed the door shut so hard it shook the house, and my wife yelled at me to be more gentle with the old place. Heading into the kitchen, my heart was thumping in my chest. I told Christine what had happened. What do you mean you saw eyes down there? There was somebody in the basement? We need to call the cops. I was trying to decide if my overtired brain had imagined it. I thought I'd seen something, but the more I considered it, less, the less likely it seemed. It could have been my eyes playing tricks on me. I'll grab a flashlight and I'll take a look. No, you can't. It's too dangerous. The place was locked up, right? So it couldn't have been a person down there. It was probably me imagining things, right? But I'll, I'll take a look just to be safe. Are you sure about this? Maybe we should call the police and have them check it out. 
It'll take them an hour just to get here. We're not in the city anymore, remember? Besides, there's no way anybody could have gotten in here since the owners left. Unless they had a key, so let me take a look. Okay. Christine reluctantly agreed and took out her phone, dialing 911 and getting ready to hit send in case anything happened. I found a flashlight in one of the boxes marked camping and opened the basement door. Taking a deep, shuddering breath, I began to descend, proceeding down the rickety steps. The beam of light showed multitudes of dust motes, particles floating in the air, being kicked up by my movements. Ancient wooden stairs creaked beneath my feet with each step I took, going down and down deeper beneath the ground. As I did, that feeling returned again, that sensation of something watching me, that unpleasant feeling beginning to grow and blossom into the worst fear I'd ever experienced in my life. As I set my foot down onto the dirt-packed floor of the lower level. The old farmhouse had an ancient relic of a basement, I realized. Since we had moved from a long ways away, we hadn't seen this place in person. This was the first time I had been down there. The owners had chosen not to include pictures of the basement in their ad, and I was beginning to understand why. Shining my light around, I saw there was old pieces of leather and ragged strips of wire, rope, and twine hanging from the ceiling's crossbeams, crude wooden crosses assembled from broken sticks, and small logs hung suspended from these, turning and swaying gently despite the lack of breeze down in the basement. I felt a presence behind me suddenly and spun around, the air turning ice cold. For a moment, for a moment I thought I saw a dark-shaped shadow, similar to a person, but there was no one standing there. Every part of me wanted to get out of there, but I knew I had to make sure the basement was empty. I shone my flashlight in every corner, every hidden spot, making sure it was unoccupied. Sure enough, it was. But I did find something. There was a black box in a stone alcove, surrounded by inscriptions carved directly into the foundations of the house. The strange shrine resembled something from a church or a temple. But it appeared darker somehow. Evil. A chill ran through my bones, which seemed to emanate from the stone. Unlit candles and strange black statues surrounded the box, sitting dead center, the focal piece of this creepy, unholy altar. I don't remember taking the box upstairs with me, but nonetheless, I found myself back on the main level, holding it in my hands. It looked curious and ancient. The feeling of someone watching remained, accompanied by an odd chill, which ran through my bones, almost like the temperature in the house had gone down by ten degrees. There's nobody down there, I told Christine, who was waiting for me at the top of the stairs, but I found this weird box and all these crosses were hanging from the ceiling. Very creepy. You need to get rid of that thing, she said, holding up her hand to cover her eyes from even looking at it. I hate it. There's something wrong with it. Really? What do you want me to do with it? I asked. It's just some old box, probably someone's keepsakes. I don't care. Put it outside, send it away with the trash on pickup day, just get rid of it. Christine never acted this way. She didn't believe in superstitions or curses. She was a self-proclaimed atheist, in fact. But the way she was acting was enough to convince me that she was serious, so I didn't argue. Okay, okay, I'll put it outside, I said. I brought it out with me into the front yard and tried to decide where to put it. I settled on leaving it in the back of the moving truck. In the glow of the lights inside the box of the moving van, I took a moment to take a closer look at the box. It was ice cold to the touch, I realized. The surface of it was slick and black like polished marble. But when I took my hand away, it smudged off like charcoal. There were archaic symbols carved into it. And a lock held it shut at the front. I found myself trying to open it, but was unable to. Distantly, I heard something whispering to me, its voice insistent and raspy, but I dismissed that as just the wind and nothing more. Eventually, I gave up on the box's lock and went inside. My wife looked startled when I walked in the front door. What were you doing out there? I thought you'd gone to bed. You were out there with that creepy box for over an hour. No. 
I started to disagree with her, but then I looked at my watch and realized she was right. I'm sure what to say. I told her that I was tired. I must have zoned out. I needed to get some sleep. Trudging up the stairs to the bedroom, I collapsed on the unmade mattress and drifted off into a deep slumber. As I slept, my dreams were filled with that dark feeling of being observed, as if eyes were watching me closely from the corner of the bedroom in the shadows. When I awoke, it was still dark outside. I looked around the pitch-black room, feeling uneasy, and saw unfamiliar shapes and shadows I didn't recognize. That sensation of being watched had returned tenfold, and I felt a presence observing me from the corner, where a man-shaped shadow stood. Running over to the door, I went to turn on the light switch. I flicked it into the on position, but the light didn't turn on. The room remaining stubbornly dark. My heart was pounding as I felt that presence staring at me in the room. I, I wanted more than anything to turn on the lights, but they wouldn't go on. For some reason, I found myself going back to bed instead of fleeing that room, terrified as I was. I found myself lying back down in bed, tucking myself back in under the covers. and staring at the thing in the corner as it watched me. That dark, unrecognizable shape in the corner of the bedroom began to move towards me. The shadow shape of a person reaching out for me, coming for me. I tried to move, but I found myself paralyzed and unable. I tried to scream, but I couldn't. I woke up panting, covered in a cold sweat, and I realized I had dreamt the whole thing. The shape in the corner of the room had revealed itself in the morning light. I saw that it was, in fact, a stack of boxes with coats draped over the top of it. It was barely sunrise outside, and Christine was in bed next to me. She bolted upright, looking startled, and asked what had happened. I had a horrible dream. It felt so real. You know those waking nightmares when you feel as if you're up, walking around, being asleep, only to realize you were out the whole time? My wife didn't answer. Her eyes were fixed on something across the room. She was looking at the dresser, and her jaw was hanging down. What is that thing doing in here? I told you to get rid of it, and you brought it up here and opened it instead? She was pointing at something, and I followed her gaze to see the black box from the basement. It was on the bureau. It was open, but I had no memory of doing that. What the, what the hell? I, I didn't do that. I definitely didn't open it. Did I? You're telling me you don't remember bringing that box in here and opening it? No, and it was locked. I couldn't have opened it. Just get it out of here. I don't want to look at it anymore, okay? Bring it to the dump or something. Just get it out of the house and far away from here. I went over to the dresser and I saw the open box was filled with strange items. A lock of hair, charred piece of clothing, cross, other burnt pieces. There was a powerful odor coming from it as well, unlike anything I'd ever come across. The stench was unpleasant. It burnt my nostrils as I drew closer. This is impossible. I know I didn't bring this in here. It's cursed or something. Just get it out of the house, please. My wife was more upset than I'd ever seen her, so I put on my clothes. I took the box out to the car with me. I don't know where the local dump was exactly, but I figured I would go look for it. As I neared the town, I saw an antique shop at the side of the road, pulled over on a whim. I wondered if the owner would be interested in taking the box off my hands, or if he could at least tell me what it was. The bell above the door rang as I entered, and a man came out from the back room, polishing a brass candelabra with a rag. Morning, he said in a friendly voice. How can I help? He stopped speaking abruptly when he saw it was in my hand. The candelabra fell to the floor with a loud clang, he began to visibly shake as he raised his finger to point at the box. Do you recognize this? I asked. Where did you find that thing? Uh, we just moved in up the road, my wife and I. Um, it was in the basement of the old farmhouse up the street. I moved towards him with my hands out to shake his hand and saw that my fingers were smudged black with the box's darkness. He backed away, slamming into the wall behind him sending a framed photo crashing to the floor, the glass shattering loudly. Don't touch me. Don't touch anything. Get out. Get out and put that back where you found it. If you do anything else with it, you will never get your life back. You should have never taken it from its resting place. You should have never come here. 
I backed away from him, terrified even more than before, especially now that I knew others were aware of the dark powers this box contained. Whatever it was, it wasn't meant to be moved. Its resting place was of extreme importance. Maybe that was why the house had been so cheap. It came with a cursed basement. The man began to throw things at me, shouting in a foreign language I didn't recognize. He was speaking harshly in English, telling me to leave and to never come back. He spoke in prayer-like incantations and made the sign of the cross over and over again. I stumbled out to my car and started the engine, driving back towards the farmhouse, wishing that we'd never purchased the place. When I pulled up outside the farmhouse, I tried to decide what to say to my wife. How would I explain to her that the box couldn't be moved? Maybe if we just left it in the basement, the presents would leave us alone. I decided I would just try to sneak in and put it back in the basement without her noticing. I would explain it to her later, or at least try to. The important thing now seemed to be to return it to its proper place before something really terrible happened. Going back inside the house quietly, I closed the front door behind me as softly as I could, and I glanced up the stairs. The light was off in the bedroom, so I assumed Christine would still be up there. I went to the basement door, and I opened it quietly, being careful not to make too much noise in case Christine had gone back to sleep again upstairs. I began heading down into the darkness beneath the house. I was holding the box carefully in my hands like a living bomb, since I wasn't sure what would happen if I dropped it or did anything wrong. Each creaking stair made my heart hammer faster as I trod down towards the dirt floor of the basement. Finally, I set foot down there and looked around, seeing only shadows. The light from upstairs was dim, and it was the only source I had to see by. My phone was in my pocket, and I kept it there, thinking I would only be down there for a few moments. Walking across the blackened space towards the alcove, which had housed the black box, I began to feel watched again. It was only then that I noticed that sensation had gone for a while. As I drove to the antique store and back again, whatever had been with the box watching me, it hadn't stayed inside after the thing had opened. It had stayed in the house with my wife. A loud bang came from the top of the stairs and the entire basement went completely pitch black in an instant. I realized the door had slammed shut and I figured Christine had closed it. Maybe she didn't realize I was home. I began to fumble for the cell phone in my pocket, needing a bit of light to feel safe down here in the terrifying basement. But before I could grab it, something attacked me. The shrieking wail it made was inhuman and and full of rage, it swiped at me with sharp claws in the darkness, and I rolled and I ducked away from it, trying to escape. I threw the box down on the floor, hoping to get away. As I got up, I hit my head on a dangling wooden cross, and nearly got wrapped up in the twine which suspended it from the ceiling. Stumbling, I tried to find my way to the stairs, screaming for my wife to help me. She didn't answer. A moment later, the thing came at me again. It was fast, but thin and just a bit weaker than me, despite its anger. I managed to grab its wrists and push it up against the wall, then tripped it to the floor. I ran up the stairs, stumbling on the steps and scraping my shins, bloodying them badly. And just as I reached the top, the thing came at me again. It was relentless. It was screaming ancient curses with spittle flying in my face. It swiped at my eyes and got one of them, blinding me. The door was just behind me, so I flung it open and I shoved the thing away from me. As the light from the main level came flooding through the open door, I saw... I saw, I saw what had been attacking me. My wife tumbled down the stairs, cracking her head open against the wall on the way down, and falling lifeless to the dirt floor of the basement below. I took a few shaky steps down the stairs, looking to confirm if my eyes had deceived me, but they had not. The thing in the box had stayed behind when I left, and it had possessed my wife driving her down into the darkness of its lair, where it felt most at home. As I stood there staring at her lifeless body, I saw her begin to twitch. Her fingers began to drum up and down, then her head began to rock and make a loud smacking sound as her forehead impacted the basement floor again and again and again hard. Christine? I called down the stairs. Stop! Stop, please! She continued to self-destructive behavior, smashing her skull hard against the dirt floor. I began to take a shaky step down to stop her, but then hesitated. That thing was still inside of her. It, it wasn't safe, and yet, yet I couldn't I couldn't let her just keep hurting herself like that. 
The meaty sound repeated again and again as I screamed for her to stop, but she wouldn't. But I wouldn't go down there again. And eventually, the thing inside of her realized that. Come save me, honey, she said in a droning beehive voice. I need you. No. I just stood at the top of the stairs, waiting. My wife appeared to have broken a few limbs during her fall, but that didn't stop her from moving quickly. Sickening sounds of bones crunching could be heard from up the stairs as she got to her feet, her one ankle failing so that she rested her weight on the splintered nub of her tibia rather than on her foot. Whatever was inside of her felt no pain, but it looked agonizing to me. She began to shuffle up the wooden stairs without warning, moving faster than I thought possible, crab-like and inhuman on four legs. It looked like she wouldn't be able to make it in her fractured bones, and yet she moved like it, like a relentless insect, her other limbs making up for the defects of the lost one. Using her arms like additional legs, she began to crawl towards me up the stairs, her fingernails digging into the splintered wood stairs and breaking off as she raced faster and faster, gaining momentum. I realized at the last second that I'd been paralyzed with terror, and I threw the door shut just as she slammed into it with a shuddering bang that rattled the upstairs windows in their frames. There was no lock on the door, and I could do nothing except hold it closed with all the weight of my body. She doesn't relent for a second, turning the doorknob consistently, pressing with all of her strength against the door as I gritted my teeth and fight against her weight. I'm sitting here, with my back pressed against the door, my feet wedged against the opposing wall with all the force I can muster. When I finish typing this out, I... I don't know what I'll do. Maybe I'll try the police, see what they say. My biggest concern is that they'll want to let her out. She'll probably pretend to be normal when they arrive. She'll pretend that I'm insane, that I attacked her. But I know that's not her. It's the thing from the basement. The thing from the black box. Whatever it is, she can't be allowed to bring it back to the surface. It was locked down in that basement for a reason. And that's where it needs to stay. Hey there, kids, it's me, Mr. Cube Pasta. I want to tell you thank you so much for watching today's video on YouTube or listening to today's episode of the podcast on the podcast. Tonight, I'm going to let you know about a couple of authors that I really love their work of, and I think all of you have too. Usually in my live streams, you guys will tell me some of your favorite stories, but these ones constantly show up, and I feel like a lot of you don't know that there's actual novels that continue on from the stories that you just hear on YouTube. And in some cases, I even do the audiobooks for them that you can find on Audible. Three of which I want to let you know about right now. The Neverglades, Volume 1, Volume 2, and Volume 3 are available right now on Amazon, both on Kindle and on paperback. And My Tiny Town Just Got Put on Lockdown is available on Amazon as one major novel that contains both Season 1 and Season 2, which is not done on the channel yet, as well as a brand new one called The Study, an Effluvium Hayes novel, which continues the story of My Tiny Town Just Got Put on Lockdown. And of course, I think one of everybody's favorite series is on here, Tales from the Gas Station, currently has a fourth volume that has just come out. I did the audio books for volume one through three. Four will come out eventually. So without further ado, I want to give a very big thank you to Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Stephanie Butler, Bobby Carmen, Tanya Oren, Tristan Pelton, Chance Burnett, Diana Krause, That One Guy, Lupita Galvin, That Creepy Chick, Tyler Fletcher, Rebecca Harper, Murky Moo, Red Shadow Cat, Xavier the Cheyenne, Demix, Sean Caddo Baker, Six Gay Rats in a Trench Coat, Turtle Man, Rob Like Sharp Things, Chaos Art, Cryolinian, Milk and Meal, Zachary Grafius, Gorang Tramagasi, Maria Walker, Pain Gravy, Crazy Kid, Mr. Marcus Blitz, Aka Limchok, Dirt Diver, Matt Bach, Jabbles Raz, Voice of Sand, Coffee Zombie, Matthew McNeese, Shelly J, Jeremy H, Raltazal, Ficomel, Nana, Nick Weaver, Deleted Account, Melted Lake, Holly Sue, Guy Mara Ravenswood, William King, Darth Miver, Michael Ortiz, Satanic Aries, Nessie, Ronnie Hansen, Bardo Hawk 764, Lambda M98, Harley, Sashi Sazaku, Croconut 509, My Body Sounds Like Rice Krispies, Kaylee Ambrose, Suji Campbell, Trickin, Azarine Fox, Freddy Krueger, Nicholas Zaccardi, Happy Birthday, Jason Wilson, Lisa Cottrell, Caspian, Hades Nephew, Tater Chip, Acid System, Prozac and Pancake Appreciation Society, Cryptic Nightmares, Kiwi the Sloth, Tommy Green, Fester's Lamb Guy Harbour, Nico Kyle, Rafael Rodriguez, The Ginger Bros, Aaron Stormcrow, Daniel Paulson, and Corey Kenshin. As always, thank you guys so very, very much. Thank all of you who are in the description down below, and honestly, thank all of you that can give anything, even when it comes down to just $1. I appreciate you guys very, very much. Sweet dreams. <laughs>